Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, hi. Yeah, I'm Rosemary, and I'm an alcoholic, so um, thank you very much for asking me to share, and it's quite amazing, you know, with all this um, pandemic and, and us all being in Zoom land and, you know, instead of just being able to get speakers from around your local area, you're able to, like, go around the world looking for speakers and so it's quite amazing and you suddenly become an international speaker. If you can put that on your resume. I'm not sure if you can. But, yeah, I'm a really grateful member of AA and, um, you know, it. It still amazes me today. I've got nine years of sobriety, and so it it just amazes me that alcohol has not passed my lips in nine years because, um, you know, it just eluded me for a very, very long time, and um, I really couldn't see myself not living living life without alcohol because I couldn't see how you could live 24 hours a day without a break from yourself. I just couldn't see how that was possible. And they said, you know, they say living with somebody else 24 hours a day is really hard. Well, how can you live with you, with yourself 24 hours a day? And so an alcohol truly gave you that break. And, um, yeah, so, and I really like what my sponsor says, that, you know, we can share about, um, you know, recovery and getting some sobriety, not because we've done a degree, not because we've paid some um, guru huge amounts of money and not because we've got it done a course or anything, but it's just because one alcoholic has pulled us out of that really dark cave and, you know, and given us our life back. And the reason, um, as Mary talked about it, and that is because another alcoholic pulled my sponsor out of a dark cave and, um, you know, from what seemed like a hopeless place in life that you just didn't seem like you could get possibly get out of I thought I was going to be on you know sickness benefits for the rest of my life my mind was just going so crazy and um but it's just another alcoholic who can really pull you out of that cave and who really understands where you where you've been and um you know one thing I like you know in meetings you can talk about your alcoholic life and you can say something to another alcoholic that you have done and if you said that to an average person outside, they would um, they they'd have a different view of you for the rest of their life, and they would really like you know maybe you know not engage with you as often. <laughs> so, but to another, if you tell those things to an alcohol another alcoholic, they've probably done them themselves, and they just go, oh, "Yeah, that's fine. I've done that. Do you want a cup of tea? Do you want a biscuit?" <laughs> you know, it doesn't phase them at all. And that's what I really like about um, AA is that is that truth. Um, it's all about the truth, and uh, it's a place where you can you can totally be yourself, and you can and turn up um, to your you know home group meeting, and someone can say how are you, and you can tell them exactly how you are. And um, and the thing about road to recovery, you can talk to different people about issues that are going on, and you get the same answer. You know, you, there's it's road to recovery, like Mary talked about. It's just all you know, what you should do every single day and um, how you should live your week, how you should live your life is all laid out for you. And if you follow those simple rules, um, you, you are guaranteed recovery. And I know my sponsor said that to me um, when I first came into Road to Recovery and I, I didn't believe him. And um, I had a male sponsor, but that was only because there were no females in the Road to Recovery group at that time. So um, that's why I had a male sponsor, not that it's something that I encourage. Um, I also like, um, you know, what somebody said um, once about AA, and that is that it costs you such a lot to get into AA, but once you're in AA, it's pretty much free. And so, you know, you spend such a lot of money just on alcohol alone, but then on, you know, um, psychologists, on self-help books, on retreats, you just spend so much money. And then when you get into AA, it's all, you know, the program is to to freely hand it on to the next person. And, um, you know, that's what the beauty of it all is. Um, a little bit about my early life. So, um, you know, Gary really touched, 
touched on it really well, you know, paralyzing fear and anxiety and absolute total feeling of worthlessness. It was like a steel thread all the way through my life. Like I just, uh, you know, from a very, very, very young age, I just, um, I, I just couldn't understand wherever I was, just I was always, okay, well, I'll get out of this, I'll get out of being here and go somewhere else and then I'll feel better. And um, I learned to be a people pleaser at a very, very young age because um, I have four brothers and everything was about my brothers. And so if I um, didn't do the right thing, um, I would not be included. And that's not my imagination. You know, since um, having sobriety, I've had... um, um, I've met with a neighbour, a neighbour of ours who was a neighbour for 20 years, and she said it was all about the boys. And so um, not that they were nasty or anything, but it's just our family was very much about teasing. And um, so everything was about the boys, and so it was all about what they were doing and their um, their activities. So I really learned to be a people pleaser at a very young age, and I really learned um, very early that if you said or did the wrong thing, you would not be included. I also remember my brother at my father's funeral. Um, he he gave, he got up and he said he was talking about all the fun things that you know they did with dad, and um, everyone was laughing. And then at the end, he goes, "I don't know where Rosemary was." <laughs> I was just like, "I just wasn't included." And so um, yeah, so that sort of really start started off my. You know, my alcoholism, you know, I hear it, hear, it, hear it said in the rooms that, you know, your alcoholism was a, alive and kicking very, very early on in age. And um, I know when I first started school and I was about six and the teacher asked me a question and I didn't know the answer and I broke down sobbing because I could not answer the question and I was just sobbing like it was, you know, the reaction of an alcoholic is extreme and my reactions were very extreme in, at a very young age. So anyway, I grew up, um, you know, into my teenage years and, um, you know, I was very, I just couldn't communicate as it's been spoken about earlier. I just could not communicate. I was just so knotted up inside. I just, I just didn't know how to talk and I didn't know how to talk to people. It's like, it's like what was, I didn't know what was going on inside me. And it's like, you know, the, the ability to talk and what was going on inside me was just severed. So, um, You know, I was very, very uncomfortable as a teenager. You know, if somebody, um, you know, look at other girls and a girl was wearing a blue jumper and she looked really happy, I'd think, oh, well, I have to wear a blue jumper. If a girl was wearing a pink jumper and she looked really happy, I'd think, well, I better wear a pink jumper. And um, I was just all this, all this mental miles is torture as a child. Like it's absolute torture. And, um, but, you know, and I felt so uncomfortable, but, you know, I, um, it was about 14 that I discovered that you can get relief from how you feel like this, that you can actually get relief from it. And that wasn't through alcohol, but it was through going to the dentist. And, um, so I had abscesses in my teeth and the, in my gums. And so I had to go to a dental surgeon and they gave me a, an anesthetic. And I was just like, this is amazing stuff. <laughs> and um, to get relief from the way that I felt. And I um, had to go back to that um, dental surgeon, you know, two more times you know, over 18 months. All I thought about was that anesthetic. I didn't think about anything else. And um, and it wasn't until I, you know, have come into sobriety, my nine years of sobriety, that I my sponsor has shown me that that's not normal thinking. Um, Because right up until then, I just, anyone who was going to hospital for a, um, for an operation, I just thought you're going to be anesthetized. Like, what's your problem? I wouldn't be worried. So, um, yeah. And so, yeah, very uncomfortable as a teenager. You know, I went into my, um, you know, started, um, you know, when I reached the age, I didn't drink when I was young, but um, when I reached the right age, you know, started going out, started drinking a lot. And, um, you know, I, so I drank, you know, excessively and I would, um, one thing I would do all my life is I would, um, you know, drink and drive. So I would never, ever, and right up until I was in AA, I would always drink and drive. I would never, ever want um, to wake up the next morning and my car not be there because I wanted that accessibility to do whatever I wanted to do the next day. And I drank and drove 
a lot. And um, I see in the paper where it says, oh, a woman found last night, you know, um, she was three times over the legal limit. I just think there are heaps of us driving around like that. And um, I'm just very, very lucky that I was in court. And so, um, you know, um, to cut a long story short, uh, as my life diverged from where I thought it should go, because I had all these visions of where my life was going to go, and as my life just slowly diverged from where that, from those visions, I just couldn't cope the pain the insecurity, and then trying to claw it all back, it just, um, I, my just drinking just escalated, just absolutely escalated. And it wasn't until I um, uh, was made redundant um, in the mid-2000s that I was to learn what alcoholic drinking was. Um, if you shake if you shake the family tree, alcoholics fall out of the tree. And um, you know, I've got a um, my mother was alcoholic. Um, she had a stroke at fifty two, was paralyzed down one side, and she passed away like two years ago. Her brother's alcoholic. Um, he was able to stop drinking of his own volition, and so he's been um, stopped drinking for about forty years. But um, I, um, when I was made redundant, um, I was looking forward to being made redundant. Um, it was, um, you know, the company, it was the fourth round of redundancies. Um, when I got wind of it happening, because the company wasn't making money, um, but, you know, that night I was trying to work out, you know, what you wear for a redundancy. And, um, you know, so I was really happy about being made redundant. And I thought, I'm going to pull my life back. Because at that point, I was, um, you know, drinking every night. I was um, just saying no to any social engagement so I could just stay at home and drink all the weekend and stay isolated. And um, so, uh, you know, you've got to be careful of what you wish for um, because I was going to turn my life around, get fit, stop drinking, um, work out what makes me happy, yada, yada, yada. Um, but I learned that if you have this disease and if you haven't gotten on top of it, you have no chance against it. It will just ravage you. It, you just have no chance against it. I had no idea that I had alcoholism, that I thought that I just suffered from fear and anxiety and alcohol was my solution. And um, anyway, um, to, you know, cut a long story short, um, I, you know, I started drinking. I said, I gave myself a drink at like 4.30 in the, morning, in the afternoon thinking, yeah, I'll, I'll just have a drink then. And um, that'll be fine. But over time, that turned out to be um, drinking 24-7. So it just got to the point where I would just be comatosed in my bed for days and I would wake up and just drink some more to pass out. So all I, all I thought was oblivion and um, I didn't want to feel. And if any feelings started to come up, um, I would just want them gone. And at one point, I thought I took up smoking to give up drinking. I thought at least if I smoke... I um, I'll, won't be out of it, and um, but I smoked like I drank, and that was just like one after the other. I really admire people in the meetings who go out, have one cigarette, come back, and then half an hour later go and have another one. But I would just smoke like I drank. And, um, and then I was in such a state, I went on to benzos, and so in the end I was, you know, drinking, smoking and taking benzos. And so I was in a really bad state. And um, I was um, wanted to do absolute serious health self harm, and I was really praying to God for um, for me not to to do that self harm, and um, because I believed in God anyway. Um, and so I, and it wasn't that I wanted to kill myself. It's just I wanted the pain to go out of my body. I just wanted it out. I just wanted it gone. I just couldn't take it anymore. And um, I was really, and they talk about it in the big book, big book where um, I think Bill could just feel that impending doom, and I one day felt that. Um, I felt like I, you know, I was in a bad place. So I, I felt like I was on the precipice of that. There's a black hole in the brain that you go into in deep depression and you don't come out for years, and I was sort of on the border of that. I could feel it. And I felt like something really bad was going to happen in the next three weeks if I didn't do something about this. So um, luckily I had heard about AA about two years earlier that somebody was going to AA because I would have thought that it would have been replaced. If I hadn't heard that, I would have thought AA was redundant and like there was now meditation, 
yoga, all those sorts of things, like not AA. Um, so I called up AA and, um, you know, I um, a girlfriend of mine who her husband, um, she thought he had a problem. So she came along with me to the meeting. And the meeting was just amazing. Like I was just amazed. I was, it was a birthday meeting. There was about 80 people there. I was just blown away. And um, here were people, one after the other, standing up there talking about their pain, talking about their insecurity, talking about their fears. I'd never heard this before. This was unbelievable to me. And um, it was all the stuff that I felt. You know, they talked about how they, um, you know, it was mentioned earlier uh, how they, um, once they started drinking, they couldn't stop of their own volition. Like the, the, the alcoholic just has that physical craving. And once you start drinking, you cannot stop. And the mental obsession that, that you're either you're drinking or you're thinking about drinking or you're thinking about stop drinking or you wake up in the morning and you just think, well, when am I going to have that drink? Like all you're thinking about is what a drinking and that mental obsession. And I heard two shares that, um, you know, you go to lots of meetings and you hear lots of shares and you don't remember, you know, many of them, but I remember that night two shares because I just identified so much. And that was one woman, um, she got up and shared and she shared about how she tried to kill her husband and she tried to poison him in his dinner and she tried to shoot him, but she missed. And um, she was now 10 years sober and still married to that man. And it showed me that because I was starting to think that alcohol was making me mentally crazy and it sort of, you know, and it made me think, you know, that maybe that's true. And then there was a, a guy got up and shared like a bikey and um, he talked about how his parents died, left in the house, left in money, drank away the money. And um, he was out, um, passed out on the front lawn woke up in his own vomit and all he wanted was another drink and I just identified with that. I just was like, my God. And so I really remember those two shares. And um, But then I still had all those, you know, defects of character because then the next thing I heard is that you should go to four meetings a week. I said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> like I said, that's absurd. <laughs> and because um, I, I thought I considered myself quite intelligent, saw the 12 steps on the wall, you know, I can do those, check them off because I'm, a, you know, a list person. I had no idea that, you know, that alcohol was just the, the symptom of my bigger problem. I was maladjusted to life. The way I reacted to life was, um, you know, I could never work out why I kept attracting the wrong type of people into my life and the wrong situations into my life. And, um, you know, I was later to find out when my sponsor took me through the 12 steps that it was the way that I reacted to people and the way I reacted to their situations. And um, as it says in the big book, if you, you step on people's toes, um, they're going to react back to you. And um, that's why I just kept reacting the same way. And um, anyway, so for the first four and a half years, you know, I was um, one foot in, a, in AA, one foot out. And so as it says in the big book, half measures of is nothing. I um, And I progressively got worse, was in rehab for, um, you know, at least twice. And, um, yeah, things just slowly got worse until... You know, one day I was just, um, I kind of, it was a Friday. I can't remember, you know, I hadn't drunk for like, I kept busting all the time through those two, for those um, four and a half years, but that was because I didn't have that defense against the first drink, as it was spoken about earlier. And I didn't have the tools of AA because I wasn't taking the actions. And um, somebody on that Friday, uh, I was just bereft of any feeling whatsoever I was just I can't even explain it what it was it was just but now I know it was surrender to whatever was going to help me and um, somebody was working their program thank god and they I hadn't seen them for three months they rang me and that got me um, to road to recovery and got me to my sponsor and um, I was in you know such a bad way and um, I knew I had nowhere else to go because I'd been around in the program for so long and um, so I was just willing to do whatever was told to me to do. And like it's been spoke about tonight, um, you know, I like structure. I like being told you do this, this, this and this and you will recover. And so I just started doing all those things and um, started getting very involved in the group. I was the first female in the group and it was with, um, there was 15, about 15 guys 
it wasn't easy those first three months, especially when we had to I had to go to dinner as well and arrive an hour early. I said to my sponsor, I have to arrive an hour early, have to sit here for an hour and a half meeting and then go to dinner with these same people because I was a fringe dweller. I wasn't somebody who stuck around the same crowd all the time. I said, don't you get bored? And, um, you know, and now I understand, no, it's so enriching. It's so enriching to have a home group, to know those people. And, you know, I've known a lot of those people for like nine years now, and it's such a great support to me. So, you know, I got very involved in the home group and, um, you know, in service and doing a service position. And um, it wasn't long, um, I think, into five months because I was the only girl that I started sponsoring. And, you know, that is an amazing um, gift to be able to sponsor other people because that's where you truly learn about the program, you know. They ask you questions. You go, hmm, I'll look at back to you. And then you go and ask your sponsor. They ask their sponsor, you know. like So, um, but that's where you really learn about the program and you really learn how to pass it on in a very simple way so that they understand it and um, they're willing to, to go on and um, actually do the program. So, um, yeah, so I do all the same things like everybody does, you know, write a gratitude list of 10 things, um, reading the Just for Today card, um, you know, obtaining numbers. And um, I remember uh, when, my, in, when I, my sponsor first said, you know, I've got to obtain numbers from um, other people, from newcomers, and, you know, so that I can call two newcomers every day. I was like, I just don't want to do that, you know. Um, I don't know what to say. And um, first of all, I um, I said, look, you go up to newcomers and then you call me over, you know. And he said, I'll do that twice and then I'm not doing it again. And I said, because I just didn't know what to say. And so, you know, now it's, um, you know, now it's, it's, it's easy. I know exactly what to say. And I'm so grateful for Road to Recovery because, I know how to pass the program on. Like before, I, I never knew. And now I can guarantee to somebody, a newcomer, if you do these things, you will recover. And when you're talking to a sponsee and their life is sort of going sideways a little bit, all you have to do is go through the program and 10 to 1, they're not doing something and um, fully or 100%. And, um, and you just need to, you know, pull them back on track. So, um, yeah, my life now, um, so I'm, you know, nine years um, of sobriety in uh, August, God willing, and, you know, I'm still in the same house, still work for the same company, still have the same car, you know, in my visions of life, I saw myself driving around in this Mercedes sports when I was older. But, you know, I've got a Holden Astra that's like 16 years old, so it's completely different. But, you know, I'm happy with my world. Um, you know, I've got the same home group. Um, you know, there are so many things that are the same around me, but what's different is me. And I really um, attract, now I attract nourishing people into my life and I attract nourishing situations and I have a lot of love and support around me. Um, so nothing's changed except me. And, the, you know, you can't change people, paces and things, as it says in the big book. And I've learned that and um, I've learned to have faith in my higher power and my higher power is God. Before I used to think that I knew that I believed in God, but I re realised after AA, AA has taught me how, how to have faith and not to try and wrap my will around all my problems in my life and try and sort them out. It's taught me just to sit back, live the day, um, do the next best thing in that day and the problems will slowly sort themselves out. And I've had some serious problems in my life where, um, you know, that involve solicitors and, you know, I've just prayed every day and um, as the days have passed, the, solution, the problems have sorted themselves out in ways I never would have envisaged. And it wasn't the solicitors that, you know, came up with the solution or anything. They just sorted themselves out and it was truly amazing. And um, thank you. So, um, yeah, so as it was spoken about um, earlier before with Amy, you know, I can go to bed. I can actually go to bed and go to sleep. That is amazing. And, um, you know, so I've, I've learned how to have some peace, some joy in my life and, um, you know, really grateful. So I'll leave it there.
and thank you for asking me to share. My name's Wayne and I'm an alcoholic and thank you for the first three speakers and like Demi's just said it's been a, a very interesting and an exciting few months where we've had uh, probably the best known AA speakers from all over the world at our group but for me it doesn't get any better than our very own Jalila J from the Inbetweeners and Herman Munster. I mean, this, this they were just fantastic tonight. And, I mean, you know, I've been at this group for 26 years and it's taken 26 days on Zoom going through the galleries to realise that we just look like a holding pen for the Jeremy Carl show. I mean, unbelievable. It was just a fantastic group. I, uh, I mean, Bill Wilson said this was a, a way of life which is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. And uh, I mean, in, in my 32 years in Alcoholics Anonymous, I mean, I've just met some amazing people. I've made some wonderful friends. I've got just some fantastic memories. And I uh, somehow managed to stay sober through more pain than I ever imagined. Now, I was once just riddled with fear and I was just in emotional turmoil and conflict and I, I, I just was full of self-hatred and self-loathing and I, I just I felt awkward and uncomfortable in social situations I, I, I was always just so ill at ease and you know, the only thing that would ever make it okay would be that sense of ease and comfort which comes almost instantly by taking a few drinks you know, just the crack of the sound of that just the, that crack of a vodka bottle or the ping of a can of a super tenants. And I just feel better. You know, life was better under the influence of alcohol. You know, life was better seeing life through a drunken haze, just one step removed from the world. It just made, it allowed me to be the person that I wanted to be. I just felt more comfortable. You know, I was where the party was at from being in that place where I just felt afraid. It, like, it, who wouldn't want to drink? Who would not want to drink? You know, people. You know, you know, my, my parents would say to me, "When you've got to stop drinking," and I and, and I would say, "You know, I just want to scream at them." You know, you don't understand. When I'm drinking, I feel better. When I'm not drinking, life is dull. Life is tedious. Life is painful. You know, it's, the, the turmoil is just too much. Just a few drinks just brightens everything up. And, you know, I would sit in my bed set and a, a car would drive past outside and I would just jump out of my skin. You know, somebody would ring the doorbell downstairs and my knees would physically knock together. I, it, it was, I, in a few drinks, it just seemed to make, it just leveled everything out. It's, you know, alcohol seemed to treat my alcoholism. That, that's really what was happening. And, uh, I mean, I, I, I'd say... I, I, I would promise, you know, my my parents, my employers, girlfriends, you know, I will never, ever drink again. But I always eventually did. And it wasn't like I didn't try to stop. You know, I tried every conceivable way that I could to not drink alcohol. You know, I tried doctors. I tried counsellors. I tried treatment facilities. You know, I went into a treatment centre, a miserable, suicidal alcoholic a few weeks later i emerged a miserable suicidal amateur psychiatrist and it did nothing for me and i the, the last thing they said to me was go to meetings of alcoholics anonymous and I, I i went to meetings every night of the week because you know i knew i was at a very young age i was in big trouble and i, I went to meeting after meeting after meeting and unfortunately i did what i saw the people around me doing and they were not doing very much. There were a lot of bright, colourful characters that kept me coming back, but there was nothing of any substance. And I would speak in at every meeting. I would share and I would whine. I would blame the world. I would blame her for this and him for that. Everybody for my problems. I would just moan and blame and moan. And sometimes I would share and I would conjure up a tear. And, and, you know, people would come up to me after the meeting. They'd say, Wayne, that was an amazing share, gut level honesty. And I'd just go back to my bed sit and I'd just be pacing around like a caged tiger. You know, life, life, you know, AA was not working for me. AA, you know, six months in AA, and life was as bad as what it ever was, if not worse. And uh, one day I, uh, I went to the wrong meeting by mistake and I, I came across the people they warned me about, you know, keep away from them. 
you know, these guys were different. You know, they spoke with enthusiasm. They, they, they seemed to have a conviction about themselves. They were excited and enthusiastic about Alcoholics Anonymous. There was just something different. You know, they, they, there was depth in weight, and they had a solution to alcoholism. And, and I desperately wanted it. You know, in Bill's words, at long last, I saw, I felt, I believed just came alive there and then, you know, because I'd leave that meeting and, and, and it was like the, 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 the roof was on fire because if you are like me, it, it's an AA truth. If you're like me, attendance at meetings about, I mean, I can attend the best meeting of Albert Sonomus week in, week out for years. I can come to the Rotary Recovery Group. I can go to any group, brilliant groups. I can sit in the middle week in, week out for years. But if I do not take the 12 steps, my life will get systematically and progressively worse over a prolonged period of time. I needed to take the steps. And for that, I needed to get a sponsor. And that's all these fools kept saying every week, every meeting, they would, they would say the same things. You know, big book sponsor steps, big book sponsor steps again and again and again. And, you know, one night I thought, yes, they say, the reason they're saying this is that because that's what I've got to do if I want to affect any change. If I want to see any significant change in the quality of my life, I would have to act on this information received. And uh, I, I did. I got one of these fools to sponsor me. And my judgment when it comes around sponsorship is, is off key because I would ring this old bloke up. I'd ring him up and I would say, you know, Oh, she, she's done it again. She really annoyed me. He said, well, bless you, lad. It's a deeply moving story. Have you read your big book today? The next week, it'd be, well, bless you, lad. Your story's touched me deeply. Go and work with a newcomer. The guy just didn't seem to listen to me. The guy just didn't seem to care how I felt. I mean, obviously, in time, I realized he cared very much. He cared deeply how I felt. He was more concerned with what I was doing. And uh, so... Um, um, amazingly, I, I, I would do these actions, I, I would do all these irrelevant actions because I, the problem always seemed to be over here and the solution he would give me was always over there. It seemed irrelevant to the problem, but I would take these actions, these dull, boring actions, which the other speakers have all talked about. I would do these things and my outlook brightened up and I was beginning to see that I could actually live sober and enjoy sobriety, which was something I could never ever have imagined before you know I, I could do this I could have what I saw in the people around me and you know I remember one day I, I, I you know I, after doing these things I called my sponsor I, I'd been up to no good and I, I called my sponsor and I said oh David I said you know oh, this is what's happened and I remember the wonderful words that came down the phone bless you lad I'm on your side if you're honest with me I'm on your side. And what a wonderful feeling that was. And that's the deal I make with anybody I sponsor. If you're honest with me, I'm on your side. And so David, he eventually died. He died sober, had a heart attack. And I uh, I had to get another sponsor, which was, you know, so I knew I needed a sponsor. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I needed to be sponsored. I needed to allow myself to be sponsored, more importantly. So I needed to get somebody else. And uh, I, I had a couple of temporary sponsors for a while. It was less than perfect really and uh, one of my sponsors came back to the world convention and he brought a lot of tapes and i hate aa tapes i mean I, I i don't like all the circuit speaker shit i just do not like it and he said to me look wait just if you're not going to listen to any of them just listen to this one guy so okay so i, I listened to this guy and i couldn't believe it there was this guy here there's old, old, another old fool and he he was he was talking how in his area he was being accused of being a dictator type sponsor and he had a a right wing group of step nazis in los angeles and I, I couldn't believe it because i was already being called a a dictator type sponsor and i had a group full of spiritual hooligans already it was just the first time i identified with somebody in aa because of their recovery but wow this is incredible so i started calling this guy i i'd, I'd ring him up every week and he started sponsoring me and i'd ring him up i'd never never met him i didn't know what he looked like Six months later, after still ringing him week in, week out, I was about to meet this guy. And somebody said, he's over there. So I went over to see him and I said, hi, I'm, I'm Wayne. And he looked at me at this like blank expression on his face. He said, I'm Wayne. I've called you every week for six months. You sponsor me. He just looked me in the eye. 
He put both hands on my head and said, you'll never drink again, kid. And off he went. Now, I'd have been forgiven for thinking, screw you. I'm not going to put up with that. You know, I've never put up with that. You know, I, I would grip no control from man or God. I would try and protect my inner integrity. I wouldn't listen to the police. I wouldn't listen to the referee on the football pitch, my employer. I wouldn't listen to anybody. And yet, why, why should I take this shit off a sponsor? But by the time I'd got to my seat, which was no more than 20 yards away, I processed this in my mind. There is perhaps not another living soul on the planet today that I will listen to. This is working for me. I do not need to be frivolous and pally-pally with my sponsor. I just need to listen to my sponsor. And, I mean, the best description of sponsorship that I've ever come across, it's actually nothing to do with sponsors. It's a long, drawn-out story, but it's just, I, I just like it. it. Maybe the newcomers will. It's um, there's Bill Wilson was in in the AA clubhouse in New York, and it, it was it, 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 and it, he said he could hear the rain coming down on the old tin roof. I mean, I don't know about you, but in the 1930s, the rain in an old New York clubhouse. I just got these romantic images of all the reflections of the neon lights and the puddles. It just it just just sounds great. He said they said the janitors came out. He had a hard day, and Lois was away. He was laid on the bed. The janitor knocked on the door and said, "Bill, another one's just turned up. Do you want me to send him away?" And Bill says, no, let, let him come up. And he said he, he heard this guy coming along the hallway and he was struggling. He was laboring. He sounded like he was in so much pain. He opened the door. This guy came in. He had a long black coat on, a, a scarf and a hat. So he took the hat off. He took the scarf off. He could see a clerical collar. He said the guy radiated a grace. There was something about his eyes. And that man was Father Edward Dowling, who became... Bill's spiritual sponsor. The re reason I tell that story is uh, Edward Dowling was, was in New York and he said he, he, he was watching some people in the, and they were ice skating. Bear in mind, this, this was a guy who it's well known. He was crippled with arthritis. He was a man in a lot of pain. He could hardly walk. He could see these people ice skating. And he said they were gliding across the ice with so much grace, they made me feel like I could do the same. That is sponsorship. My sponsor wanted more for me than I ever believed I could ever attain myself. My, you know, my, if my sponsor could do this, I can do it. You know, that, that's just sponsorship. Because for me, you know, without with, with just God, with because often you hear people say, "Oh, you don't need a sponsor; you just need God." I've taken the first step; it's a spiritual program, all about God. If it's when it's just me and God, this is how it goes. You know, I speak to my sponsor and I and I say, uh, "I've met this woman; it feels right. It just feels right." He says, "You know, kid, you're going to get yourself into a world of trouble. Just don't do it." Whatever you think, but just don't do it. So I go home and I'm in the front room and I, and, I, and I speak to God. I say, God, if you don't want me to see this woman, just give me a sign. And the chandelier starts spinning around. The pictures on the wall are spinning around. You know, the windows of the curtains are blowing in and out. And there's big cracks in the wall and it's just thunderous. It's just and, and it's dust and shit everywhere. And I'm sitting there. It goes quiet. And I just say, any old sign. <laughs> because when it gets like that, I may as well be sponsored by a magic mirror. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? And that gets me into trouble. That gets me into deep trouble. That broad, bright highway that I was hop, skip, and dancing along becomes narrower and narrower and narrower until it becomes a cold, dark tunnel. And I'm crawling. And all you can see is the glow-in-the-dark AA ejector cord. You call your sponsor and he says, well, you're in the shit, kid. Just stand up, two steps to the left, four steps forward, keep your head down. So I stand up, take two steps to the left, five steps forward and bang my head. The glow-in-the-dark Ejected cord is still there. You know, every part of me, just run, run. It's, get, it's too painful. Just run, leave. You ring your sponsor. 
He says, okay, kid, one step to the right, five steps forward, jump, call me next week. And you do what he says, and slowly over time, by taking the action, things start to brighten up again. And you learn some AA truths. I've just said it, time. Because people, somebody like me, people say this a lot. Just give it time. Just give it time. It all gets better in time. If you're like me, time does nothing. It's dependent on what I do in the time. I had to continue to take the actions. I did not change the game plan. Just keep marching regardless of how I feel. When my sponsor says of, of all the things he's learned in over 60 years of AA experience, is that sometimes we really do believe that our case is different in that none of you people understand. Nobody else understands. You know, my circumstances are different. You manufactured all your misery. You know, my case is different. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the greatest of them all? That's all that is. And... uh I mean, another example of that, you know, Bill Wilson, again. I mean, because regardless of how I feel, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, I have to continue to take the actions. I just take the actions regardless. Sometimes we've got to crawl along the road, but we just take the actions regardless of how we feel. Bill Wilson Again, he, he must, he, he's obviously always working very hard because it says in AA Comes of Age, he, he, he came home from work. He, 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 and he actually says, he uses this phrase. He says, he says I, I was sore. He was pissed off. He, he actually says, I was in far from spiritual mood. You think about that. I, was in, I felt in far from spiritual mood. 30 minutes later, He'd wrote the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's pretty good going for somebody in far from spiritual mood. Now, we are not responsible for the results. We just got to continue to take the actions as best as we can again and again and again. I mean, I've got this, um, I mean, I, I'm fascinated with the, the military. I'm, I'm absolutely, I'm never in the military, but I'm just fascinated with the military. You know, you, you, you see on the telly or in the newspaper, you see this, somebody's been awarded a medal. They, they've got these really heroic acts of bravery and under fire. And they, you think, wow, how did they do that? You know, how did they do that? That was just, I mean, I'd be under the, you know, I, how? In, 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 invariably, you, you read or you listen, whatever, on the telly, whatever. And at the end, they say, you know, how did you do that? We trusted in our training. You know, I trusted in my training. And that's what we do here in Alcoholics Anonymous. We get into good habits early. You know, all the other previous speakers have mentioned it. We get into those good habits early, those those basic disciplines. And over time, it's because it's like, I, mean, I was speaking to somebody a while ago. I mean, he's he quite, quite, quite famous. He was, uh, he wrote the book Gravel Two Zero. And I, and I said to him, look, how important is your training? And he, he said to me, repetition, repetition, repetition. We can't make those life-saving decisions until we've got the basics right. So in AA, when all hell breaks loose and things are falling down around me and people are really annoying me, things are not going the way I want, and it just feels like my AA rug's been pulled out from underneath me, I just trust in my training. We just keep taking those basic actions that we were shown, those actions which brought us to a place of comfort in the first place. And that's worked wonders for me. I, uh, I mean, it, say, it, it says in the book, if we fail to perfect and enlighten upon our spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for other people, we would not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. If we did not work, we would surely drink. Now, I mean, so we have to grow spiritually. And the thing is, I mean, the way I see it is my relationship with God 
is simply a reflection of my relationship with people, the people around me. And it's in a group like this, I mean, it's just so easy to just, because it's structured and it's disciplined. And, and don't get me wrong, this is great for new people and it's great for people who really are in the shit. But when that's not the case, and we are trying to perfect and enlarge our spiritual life to try and grow in effectiveness and understanding, as it describes in the book, it isn't enough just to go gratitudeless. Tick, read my big book. Tick, called my sponsor. Tick, just for the day card. That isn't enough. Where I have to work at deserving sobriety, where I really have to pay the price, where, I, where the work really counts, is when I'm in a room with people with different religious beliefs, with different political beliefs, and there are people who are just brilliant sharers, and there are people who are dull. When there are people who are popular and there are people who are less popular, when there are people who have been sober a week, a month, a year, and people who have been sober 20, 30 years, is I try to show love and kindness, tolerance and compassion, all these principles. And the thing is, there is a special place in the world where wasters and misfits Flawed and imperfect alcoholics can at least begin to try to practice these principles. And that place is called the Road to Recovery Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. So regardless of what is going on around me, I just continue to try and do those things which I've done at the beginning. You know, regardless of what's new, cool, trendy, I just keep doing what I've always done. I try my best to be the best example that I can be. It's not always been a great one. Sometimes it's been a terrible one. Just try to do the best that I can, try to help people and just to keep walking the road. And I think I'm going to finish then. I just want to say to the Road to Recovery Group, thank you so much for 32 years of sobriety. I've loved every minute of it when you put it all in perspective. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.